Well, I was uh, chatting outside a, a little bit ago before the service started, and, and, and I, I have come to the conclusion that we could fill this house with a VIP section. And I've been praying about that. How many of you would buy a monthly subscription, a VIP subscription to Fellowship of the Hills? You're saying, well, Pastor, what do I get? Here's what you're going to get. A VIP subscription to Fellowship of the Hills. You're going to get valet parking on Sundays. How many of you like valet parking? Yeah, you're going to get valet parking. We are going to have recliners up in the front row. You'll have your own recliner. And then during the service, we'll have someone bring you coffee to keep you awake. How many of you would buy that subscription? Well, listen, the seats here are free. You don't have to pay for these. How many of you would like to sit in the front seat? Anybody want to sit in the front seat? Who's daring enough to come sit in the front seat with me? Come on. Can some of you come up here and sit in the front? Who's, there, look at that. Look at that. I got to give them a big hand. There you go. I love it. I love it. I, I, I took care of my gum before I came up here. I was doing a revival years ago, and I was down in a little place called Sop Choppy, Florida. Anybody know where that's at? I was preaching at First Baptist of Sop Choppy years ago. I was doing a revival. The first Sunday, they had a stage similar to this, and the Holy Spirit just got a hold of the message, and before you knew it, I, I, and I've never done it since, I had a piece of gum in my mouth, and it hit about four rows back. <laughs> The lady was so kind, she brought it back to me. <laughs> now, that's the power of the Holy Spirit working in the church. Now, listen, each and every one of you by now should have had a piece of paper that was given out to you. It's got uh, uh, two sections of nine dots on it along with a, along with a, a, a little uh, brain teaser there. How many of you like brain teasers? I love those. Uh, the older I get, the more I try to do those so I can keep myself in tune. But one of the things I found interesting, and the one that I gave you this morning is simply this. In fact, I shared one of these years ago. You may remember, and if you do, then you shouldn't have any problem filling it out. But how many of you believe that in order to truly understand who God is, to understand what he did for us as we think of the journey to the cross, we have to think outside of our finite mind? Our finite mind is captured in this little box. How many of you would agree with me? And how many of you, uh, maybe you've had some classes in school where you were given this problem that you had to solve, like this one that I've given you here, and you finally said enough's enough, I'm not even going to try it because it hurts too much. Anybody ever felt like that? So, so right there for you this morning, I'm going to give you a second or two, and then I'm going to show you how to do that. You have two simple problems to solve with nine dots. The first one is simply this. Now, remember, you have to think outside the box. If you think inside the box, you will never accomplish this. So on the first series of nine dots, you can have four lines. Draw four lines, but without picking your pen up, and you have to connect all nine dots. Is it possible for that to be done, yes or no? Absolutely. So go ahead and try that this morning, and let's see if you can do it. There's actually two ways to do it. I'll do the simplest one for you in just a moment. So draw four lines, connect all nine dots without picking your pen up. All right. Everyone's had an opportunity to do that. How many of you still haven't been able to figure it out? It's okay to look on your neighbor's paper. All right, here we go. I'm going to do it real simple for you. Are you watching? Now, we're not going to pick our pen up. We're going to connect all nine dots. There you go. How many of you are going, I, I knew that was, yeah, I could do that. What do you have to do? You have to think outside the box, right? And you can connect all nine dots. Now, I want you to look at the next one. The next one, I want you to take three lines without picking your pen up and connect all nine dots. Again, think outside the box. This is where the Lord is. He is in the supernatural. He is not in the natural. He is in the infinite. He is not in the finite. Real quickly, going to give you an opportunity to do that. For those watching online, draw your nine dots just like this and give it a shot. All right. Now, this one here is a little bit more tricky. All right, here we go. We've got to start here. We've got to come all the way out here so we can come all the way back in here. 
so we can come all the way back in there to connect those. Yes, I did connect it. All right. Now, here's your next question, and this is it. Again, think outside the box. Think outside the finite. Think in the infinite. Think in the supernatural realm is where our Lord operates. And you're going to see that this morning. You're going to have to understand that as we get into the journey of the cross. So you have all these words, sorrow, sickness, happiness, crosses, risk, sun, and darkness. Here's your question. I am the beginning of sorrow and the end of sickness. You cannot express happiness without me, yet I am in the midst of crosses. I am always in risk, yet never in danger. You may find me in the sun, but I am never out of darkness. What am I? What am I? Who knows the answer to that question? Anybody know the answer to that question? Yes, ma'am. S. You win. S. Do you see it? How many of you were looking for something else, something really smart, right? (laughs) It's S. S is at the beginning of sorrow, right? And the end of sickness. S is found in happiness. It's in the middle of the crosses. S is in the sun. It's always in darkness, but it's never in danger. How many of you enjoyed that little brain teaser this morning? How many of you would like to have one of those every Sunday? I would because it wakes you up. Thinking of our Lord in the supernatural, in the infinite. To truly understand and to comprehend who God is, we have to think in that realm. As I began to think of this Easter month, as we take the journey to the cross in this first message, I was quickly taken to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and again, I would encourage everyone, please, to follow along with me in your copy of God's Word to highlight those areas and to make some specific notes. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, where did we see these words before? In the beginning. We saw that in Genesis, did we not? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen? When we think of time, finite Finite mind. When I think of time, I look at my watch. There is a beginning to the day and an end to the day. Yes or no? Right? So, so we look at our watch, and, and we watch the seconds tick by. And we understand with our finite mind that as the second ticks by, that is the end of that second, which will subsequently be the end of a minute, which will subsequently be the end of an hour, and then the end of a day. End of a day, end of a week, end of a month, end of a year, right? How many of you are getting older? Some of you needed to raise your hand. How many of us are getting younger? i got to be honest with you, I'm getting younger. I know Jesus Christ is my Savior, and my lifespan has just begun. Amen? You see, this old shell is sooner or later going to be put into a tomb or into a grave, but you know what? I am a new creation in Christ. Amen? So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let me ask you this question. Think outside the box. Think outside the finite. Was there ever a beginning for God? How many of you would say no? You are correct. There was never a beginning for God. God always was. Now, how many of you, when you really think of that, look at your watch and you go, God always was. How many of that, that just kind of burns my head a little bit, right? Because my mind is finite. It has a difficult time understanding infinity. It, it has a different, uh, it, uh, it just has a hard time understanding that there is something that always was. How many of you drive a car? Wouldn't it be great if your car would always be what it always was? Right? Wouldn't it be great if you never had to put tires on it? Wouldn't it be great if you never had to change the oil? Wouldn't it be great if you got it and it never had a payment? Amen? Wouldn't it be great if, if, if it was like that and you never got that 1-800 call about your warranty expiring? Wouldn't that be great? Right? But you see, we think in the finite. We see things that have a beginning 
and we see things that have an ending. God had no beginning. God will have no ending. So we see in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created. God created what we see as finite. He created the heavens and the earth, right? How many of you have ever grown a plant? Does a plant have a beginning and an ending, yes or no? Sure it does. We also understand that our physical life has a beginning and an ending. Now I take you back to John chapter 1. Notice this, please don't miss this. In the beginning was the Word. Classroom, question. Who was the Word? Jesus, very good. Jesus Christ was the Word. So in the beginning, there was Jesus. How many of you would agree with me, Jesus always was? Good. So in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was Jesus. And the Word was what? With God. Jesus was with God. And the Word, Jesus, was God. Now, how many of you, that just short-circuited something, right? Right? Because we think of God, right? We, we've heard this. There is the triune God. He is the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, right? But how many of us have a hard time with our mind comprehending that? All three parts. Well, I began to think of that, and simply for me, an illustration is this. Water. Can water have or be three parts, yes or no? Water can be a liquid, yes or no? We pour it out. In fact, I've got some water right there. And I think inside this water, it also has, it does, it has some ice cubes in it. It's a solid, right? Water can be a solid. And what else can water be? A gas, a vapor, or steam. So water can be all three things. Isn't it amazing that God is all three God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So in the beginning, now why is this important, and how is this relevant to the journey of the cross? I want you to understand as we dive into this that Jesus always was. And I want you to understand there was always a plan. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was what? In the beginning with God. And it says all things came into being through who? Through him. He was a part of all, all of creation. He participated in all creation. And apart from him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. So I want you to understand this morning, as we dive into the journey to the cross, Jesus always was. In fact, you've got a couple of places there in your bulletin to write some things down. Write this down. You'll have a fill in the blank. In the beginning, God had already laid the foundation for Jesus to go to the cross. We're going to see that in a moment. In the beginning, God had already laid the foundation for Jesus to go to the cross. The cross was not an afterthought because it was always God's plan. Now again, that's very difficult for our finite mind to comprehend this. Because we have to also understand the character traits of who God is. God is omnipotent. What does that mean? God is all-powerful. He could speak it into existence. He could take the very dust that he created and breathe into it and create you and I. All-powerful. God was omniscient. What does that mean, church? He is all-knowing. He is all-truth. There is nothing that he does not know. And let me ask you this question. I need to know who you are in this church. Where, where are my people that know everything? I know you're here because some of you call me. <laughs> where are you? There are many of us that, I, I, can I be honest with you? I don't know everything. Thank you, Niall. Um, <laughs> I thought for sure Susan would yell out, praise the Lord. I, I, I'll admit it. I don't know everything. I am constantly learning. You know what? I don't know everything about this book. 
Some of you ask me some questions that stump me, and I have to do a lot of research. You know why? Because this is the living Word of God. Anybody ever read a verse and then read it a week, read it a week later, and it, and it comes to life in a whole different way? Oh, that's why I challenge you so much to open the book and read it, meditate on it. Listen to me. As difficult as it is for us to comprehend this, did you know that way before God ever created the heavens and the earth, way before God ever created man, he knew man would sin. Did you know that? He knew that. Why is that? Because God is all-knowing. And therefore, if God knew that, God already had a plan to draw us back to him through his son, Jesus Christ. So the journey to the cross is to understand that nothing happens without God knowing it and to know that God always has a plan. I went to Isaiah chapter 46. Write this down. You can research this later. Isaiah chapter 46, verses 10 through 11. It says, declaring the end from the beginning. Is there anybody in this room who can declare the end from its beginning? How many of you know how your life will end? How many of you have, had made, have, have actually asked the Lord and you've given him a plan for it? I have. There are certain ways I don't want to go. Anybody ever dived? If you've ever dived before, one of the things you have to do when you take your diving test is when you're underwater, they don't tell you when they're going to do it. They turn the air off to your tank. They love to do that when you're about 20, 30 feet underwater. And you take that breath, and it's no longer there. I never want to run out of air in the water. I, that's on my list. I wrote that down for the Lord. Never let me drown. I don't want, to happen. I don't want that to happen. So I've got a laundry list of the, the things I don't want to happen to me. I, you know what I said? I said, Lord, if you would, I, here's what I would love to do, is, is maybe just be, I know it would freak you all out. I would love to be up here preaching, and all of a sudden the Lord said, it's time, Marty. Boom, and then just hit the floor. How many of that would freak you all out? I, I, I will promise you we would have an invitation service like you have never seen before that Sunday. <laughs> Believe it or not, that's, that's my number one choice. Lord, I want to be standing. I want to be delivering your word. And you call me home. I love that. Freak him out, Lord. But if my second choice is, I'd just like to maybe be in bed, you know, and just, just go. How many, how many of you got that choice? You want that one. Yeah, you all raise your hand for that one. But, but notice what the verse says. It says, declaring the end from the beginning. We don't know how life is going to end for us. How many of us know how, how this country is going to end up in, in the next six months or, or the next four years? Do we know that? We don't know that. Only God knows that. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my plan will be established. God is saying here, my plan will be established. And he goes on, and I, and I go back to the latter part of verse number 11 that says, truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. Clap, pass, I have planned it, I will certainly do it. God says, I have a plan, and I'm going to do it. Now, if, if we look at Jeremiah chapter 29, 11, how many of you believe as we look at that verse, and this is where the Lord says, for I know the plans I have for you. How many of you believe that God has a plan for you? So, 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 so if we look at the beginning of time and we truly understand and comprehend with our finite mind, the infinite mind of who God is, and we understand that he operates on a supernatural realm and we are in the natural, and we try with the best that we possibly can with our finite mind to comprehend who God is, that we understand that God has a plan, a plan that had already been set in motion before time, before the heavens were created, before you and I were born, God had a plan for salvation. Amen. So our journey to the cross takes us all the way back to a time that we don't even comprehend in the mind of God. And you know what? When I really think about that, I truly understand how much God loves me. The Word of God says He draws all men to Him. So... As I was preparing this message and the Holy Spirit was working in my life and, and those that are in the sound booth know this, I, I, I must have sent them three or four different versions of the PowerPoint this morning because the Lord continued to make some changes up until, the last, up until late last night. 
And I said, Lord, uh, can you show me an example I can share with them? And I'd like to take it, if you would, Lord, from the Old Testament. And so he took me to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. Now, we've already established that God had a plan. Now, God in his word, I truly believe, always gives us examples of what his plan is before his plan ever unfolds. Would you not agree with me, church? I think of life sometimes. In fact, maybe I need to preach this message again. It's been quite some time since I've preached it. Life is a puzzle. How many of you have figured that out? You see, today there's only one piece of your puzzle. How many of you know that God already knows the picture? He already knows. And he knows where every piece of the puzzle goes. What's interesting is, is that sometimes what we try to do is put the wrong piece in the wrong place. Amen? Anybody ever do that? I try not to build puzzles because that's what I try to do to get it over quickly. Until the grandkids look and go, Pappy, it doesn't belong there. I said, today it does. Genesis chapter 22. Would you pick up with me, please, at verse number 1? I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version. That's what I have on the screen for you this morning. But if you'll bear with me and, and follow along as I read, it says, Now it came about, now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, how many of you would like for the Lord to call your name? Did you know he knows your name? And do you know he's calling you all the time? Marty, yes, Lord. Go plant a church in Blairsville. Some other time. <laughs> He's always pricking our heart to do the things that he would like for us to do in serving him. Hey, listen, as an advertisement, while I'm on that subject, I just thought I'd throw this out next week as our ministry expo. We're going to have 12 tables set up in the back of the church, and you're going to have an opportunity to see all the different ministries going on here at Fellowship of the Hills, a place where you can find and plug in to serve the Lord. Anything from uh, children's ministries to the parking lot. And uh, Bill, where are you at? You're in here. I, I heard that they were talking about you in the parking lot ministry this morning. You guys look really good out in the fall. We need to get you some lights that flash while you're out there. I almost ran over Chris this morning. Um, the, the hospitality ministry, uh, teaching Bible studies. we got a new ladies' ministry that's kicking off. All these different places to plug in. And listen, the Lord is calling you. He's speaking to you and asking you to use those gifts and talents to plug into his ministry. So he says, Abraham. And Abraham says, here am I. How many of you will say, here am I, Lord, use me? Thank you, Mike, for raising your hand. I appreciate that. Yeah. Come on, let me try that again. How many of you would say, Lord, here I am, use me? Yes. Did we get all that on camera? <laughs> we will use that next week. In verse number two, he said, God says to Abraham, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Now, in order for us to truly understand this, we go back to Genesis chapter 15, verses five through six. Highlight that, go back and research that in just a moment. Genesis chapter 15, 5 through 6, God told Abraham that he would give him an heir. He says, look at the sky and count the stars if you're able to count them. Your offspring will be that numerous. He had made a promise to Abraham that he would give him an heir that would be as vast as the stars through his son. So here he is, he's, he's telling Abraham in verse number two, he says, take the one that you love, your son Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. How many of you say, Lord, here I am? And then he says, this is what I want you to do. How many of you go, Lord, there's a bad connection. Can't quite get that today. The cell tower's down. So Abraham notices verse number three. So Abraham arose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he split wood for a burnt offering, and he arose, and he went to the place of which God had told him. Now what I love about that verse is, is there was no question mark. I want you to notice this. When God calls us, when he speaks our name and he asks us to do something, how many of you, maybe you're like me, that sometimes you say, well, Lord, uh, now's not a good time. I, I'm, I'm not financially capable to do that. Lord, do you realize i got other plans? Some of us are like that, right? I mean, let's be honest. I was telling the praise team this morning, I was... Uh, before I get ready every Sunday, Susan and I, we, we channel surf, and, and there are several different pastors I just enjoy listening to, and this morning I was listening to Dr. David Jeremiah, and one of the things he was saying, he says, you know what's wrong with the problem with our churches today? And when he said it, I thought, well, what's he mean by this? He says, we don't have any drug problems in our churches today. 
So what's he talking about? And then I shared this with our praise team this morning as we were praying. You see, I remember having a drug problem. John and I had a drug problem when we were in church. We were drugged to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday night. Amen? You know what's wrong with our world today? There's no drug problem in churches. People aren't being taken to church anymore. Parents just drop them off. Or parents don't even consider about taking their kids to church. Sadly, he reported that in, in, in the state of California, one out of five members, one out of five members in church come to church regularly. Two out of five members come twice a month. And then the rest of them just kind of show up when they want to. Now think about that just for a moment. We wonder why we're in the condition that we're in. This is a very simple thing here. We should have a, in fact, I posted it this morning in my Facebook page. If you follow my personal page, I said, wouldn't it be great if we were excited about coming to church? I, I was joking with you about the VIP seats. I often wonder if we had a VIP section and you knew you had to pay for it, you would come. Amen? Right? I mean, do you know the stands at a football game will be filled? They'll be filled for the Atlanta Braves playing baseball. They'll be filled at a NASCAR race. And you pay good dollar to go. Anybody ever been to one of those things? You don't walk out of there without spending $100, $200, right? Maybe that's what we need to do. We're going to start charging $10 for a cup of coffee. Amen. I mean, can you imagine? People pay that kind of money, right? Did you know it's free when you come here? And you know what you get to hear? You get to hear about a Savior that loves you so much that he gave his life for you. And it was a plan that had already been set in motion because he loves you that much. And he can change your life. He can make your life new. Abraham said, here I am. He didn't question what God asked him to do. He did it. And notice in verse number four, it says, and on the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and he saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. I bet that was an interesting conversation. Amen? We know that because this is what takes place in verse number 7. Isaac spoke to Abraham. Isaac says this to his dad. Father, Abraham says, here I am, son. Isaac said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Hey, dad, we, we got everything we need for the offering. I'm smart enough to know that. But dad, wh where's the lamb? Notice what Abraham says. I want you to underline this. Don't ever forget this. In anything that you face in life, Abraham said, God will provide. Can any of you attest to that and say praise the Lord to that this morning? God will provide. Hey, did you know God provided a Savior? You already had the plan. Abraham said to his son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar there, and he arranged the wood, and he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Hmm. How would you have liked to have been Isaac? You just asked your dad, Dad, where is the lamb? And your father said, God will provide. Oh, son, come here. I need to tie you up. Nowhere in the scripture do we see where the son fought his father. He trusted his dad. He was obedient to his dad. And then what does his dad do? Lays him on the altar. Where's all my youth at in here this morning? How many of you guys would go along with that? <laughs> I don't even want to give up my cell phone. Better yet be laid on an altar. Verse 10, 
Abraham stretched out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and he said, Abraham, Abraham. And what did Abraham say? Here am I. The angel said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now, I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And then Abraham raised his eyes and he looked and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and he took the ram and offered him on the burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. There's a few things I want you to write down and I want you to notice in this passage of Scripture. In Abraham, we see a paradigm of faith. We see the parallels of both Isaac and Christ as we look at this incredible example The faith of Abraham. It takes our faith to believe in what God can and will do in our life. Would you not agree with me? Notice a few things. Isaac was a miracle from God. Would you not agree with me? If you know the story of Isaac, Isaac was born to Sarah. Sarah was in her 90s. God had made a promise. I cannot remember a time in my life, maybe you can, but I don't think so, of a lady in her 90s having a child. (laughs) One of our elderly elderly ladies said, that's a horrible thought. (laughs) Think about that for a moment. Would you not say that that was a miracle from God? God made a promise to Abraham. We saw that in Genesis chapter 15. And Abraham even said, my wife is of years. And God said, I'll provide. I'll take care of that. It's going to happen. Now let me ask you a question. The parallel. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. You know, that's never happened in history, except for that one time. The Holy Spirit came upon Mary, and she conceived the very Son of God. A miracle. Did you know Isaac was the beloved son of Abraham? Isaac was the only son that Abraham and Sarah had. At that moment, that was the one that God had made a promise to. And how is it that God would make a promise that this son would be the one that would be, what, the one that would just, you know, the, the, the incredible uh, stars as we see them in the sky would be the one that would have all of this incredible growth within Israel, why is it that God would tell him to take his son? God the Father, John chapter 3, verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave what? His only begotten son. Can you guys see a parallel there? To understand that kind of love. The willingness to give of his son, to be obedient, to do what needed to be done for the sacrifice. Kind of interesting, too, I see these parallels here that notice in verse number four, it says, and on the third day, kind of interesting, Jesus was in the tomb for three days. I see some other parallels in this as I think of the plan that God had set, and he gives us an example, a beautiful example. I wrote this down in my notes. There was Isaac who did not fight his father when he was bound and he was laid on the wood. The word of God says that Jesus gave of himself willingly for you and for me. Can I be perfectly honest with you? I have a pretty good tolerance for pain. Unless it's a paper cut, then the whole world comes to an end. But pretty good tolerance for pain. But can you just go with me, please, for a moment to the scene of the cross? Do you know when Jesus was arrested and he was taken and he was placed before the trials that he had to endure, 
they would subsequently beat him unrecognizably. Like Isaac, he carried the wood to the altar. Did you know Jesus carried his own cross? Did you know Jesus laid down on that cross as they nailed his hands and his feet? Not one time did he say, no, they're not worth it. I'm not going to do this. But he willingly gave of himself. Now here's something interesting. Because we see something that changes. You see, Isaac was to be the sacrifice. But what did God do? God chose something else to be the sacrifice. To be the, sub, the, to, to be the substitutionary sacrifice for Isaac. What was it, church? The ram. Did you know that my sin separates me from God. And there's a payment that must be made for my sin. Did you know that? And for yours. But God loved me so much that he sent his son to be my substitutionary sacrifice. Well, I'll tell you what, we ought to be jumping up and down and rejoicing for that. So instead of Isaac being the sacrifice, there was the ram in the thicket that God provided. You see, God provided Jesus Christ to be your sacrifice and mine. A journey to the cross. What a great example that we see here in Genesis chapter 22. And then we, we fast forward as we look at some other illustrations that we are given as predicted by the prophets in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, notice this. It says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Did you know the Lord is constantly giving us signs of things that are going to happen? Can I ask you a question? Has the Lord given us signs as to when the end times will be? He says, as it is in the days of Noah, so shall it be. Let me ask you a question. Do you think we're seeing some of the days of Noah today? Yes or no? The Lord said in verse number 14 of Isaiah chapter 7, he says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. His name will be Emmanuel. Jesus was born of a virgin. The word Emmanuel means God with us. We saw that in John chapter 1. We look in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6, 6 through 7. It says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked abandon his way and the, and the unrighteous person his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord and he will what have what? Compassion. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God provided a sacrifice for us. It was predicted that he would be born of a virgin. Isaiah 9, 6 is, For a, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, But as for you, Bethlehem, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will come forth, for me, to be the ruler of Israel. His times of coming forth are from what church? From long ago. That means it had already what? Been pre-planned. This was not an afterthought of God. For you one will come for me to be the ruler in Israel. His times of coming forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. What are the days of eternity? How many of us, again, can comprehend that with our finite mind? God always had a plan for the journey to the cross. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. By the way, all of these are in the Old Testament. Zechariah 9, 9 says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is what, church? Righteous. And endowed with what? Salvation. Who is the only one that can provide salvation for you and for me? His name is none other than what? 
Jesus Christ. He is humble. Mounted on a donkey, even a colt in the fall of a donkey. Hey, what is that Sunday that's just before Easter that we celebrate? Palm Sunday. You see, the word of God in Zechariah predicted that he would even come riding on a colt, on a donkey. The prophecy was fulfilled in the manger. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 22 through 23. The very first few words of this says, now all this took place. You know what that tells me? I wrote in the margin of my Bible, it became reality. It happened. Hey, have you, have you had the opportunity to read this book and see the prophecy fulfilled in the time in which we live? Yes or no? Have you seen things that the Lord said that he would do in your life happen? Now, all this took place so that was spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled. Prophecy would be fulfilled. In verse number 23, Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they shall name him what church? We saw this in Isaiah. Name him Emmanuel, God with us. In John chapter 1, verse 14, And the word became flesh. Well, what did we see in the very first verse of John chapter 1? In the beginning was the what? In the beginning was the word. In verse number 14, the word became flesh. So Jesus was in the beginning, and Jesus came to become flesh. And he dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the what? The only son from the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. You know what I wrote in the margin of my Bible? Full of grace. I am thankful for God's grace. I am thankful for God's grace. Because you see, my sin, the payment for it is death. But because of God's grace and his mercy, he sent his son to be my substitutionary sacrifice. And I accepted his payment for my sin. And that's freely offered to every one of you that are in this room, those that are tuned in online, to anyone who hears the name of Jesus Christ and believes it in a heart and calls upon that name, the Word of God says, shall be saved. Why would anyone turn that down? Can you imagine Isaac? I'm just picturing this. Can you imagine Isaac laying there, he's bound up, and and now he realizes that he is to be the sacrifice. And the angel yells out to his dad, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. And then Abraham looks over at what God has provided with the ram in the thicket. And then Abraham says, man, I went to an awful lot of work for this. Let's just go ahead and follow through with it, you know? I mean, that sounds kind of crazy, right? Doesn't that kind of sound crazy for us? Why would I want to pay a sin debt that has already been paid for? Amen? Why would I want to do I think to myself, only a fool would do that. I've used this analogy before. And, and by the way, if there's someone in here that would like to do that for me this morning, if you will meet me after the service, uh, when I get ready to say this, I, Susan and I will give you a hug and we'll thank you. I still have a mortgage on my house. It's not a lot, but it's a mortgage. We faithfully send that payment in every month. And every now and then I can make two payments at one time. But we we can do a dance with that. That's just kind of cool. How many of you enjoy paying your mortgage payment? Come on, I want to see who you are. You look forward to it every month. Well, now we can just push the computer and send it in, right? None of us do. I would love it if someone at the end of the service would walk up and say, Pastor, I just want you to know how much I love you. Man, I just love you so much. I want to pay off your mortgage. I'm going to hug you. I'm going to be honest with you. I'll even take you to lunch today. But I'm going to hug you. Some of you are thinking, I wonder how much it is. (laughs) Wouldn't I be a fool? If you walked up to me and you say, Pastor... I love you. I love you so much. I want to pay off your mortgage. And I would say to you, 
you just don't know how much I enjoy paying that every month. I think I'm just going to keep doing it. But thank you. How many of you would think I'd be a fool? Now, let me ask you a question. Come on, come on. Don't you think it's foolish to know that God loved you so much that he sent his son for you? And he paid your sin debt. And it's free. The word of God says we come in faith believing that Jesus Christ is the only way of our salvation. And we call on the name of Jesus Christ, confessing our sins. And the word of God says he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why would I turn that down? You know what some people tell me? Pastor, you know, I believe in what Jesus did on the cross, but right now I really don't want that. I got too much life to live. I don't want to have to give up things. Can I tell you something? It's not what you give up, it's what you get. You know, too many times we think that way. i got to give this up and give that up. I've read that book, and man, there are some things in there that sound kind of tough. You know what the greatest thing about my salvation was, is to know that there are things in my life the Lord changed. The Word of God says I can become a new creation in Him. It says old things are passed away, all things become new. It's a daily process of him molding and making me what he wants me to be, holy and righteous in his presence, to be just like him. It's a daily process. You know what? As I look, how many of you, again, the miracle of salvation, how many of you looked back on your life and you think, man, this is who I once was. This is who I am today. And only Jesus could have done that. Amen? Amen? You see, it's not what you give up. It's what you get. He said, well, pastor, what if I still want to do this stuff? You know, there's something about the, the power and the presence of Jesus Christ in your life. There are some things that you probably are doing that it's not going to taste good anymore. You're not going to want to do it anymore. And the word became flesh, full of grace and full of truth. And here's how I close. In Philippians... Chapter 2, it's up on the screen. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. The Apostle Paul is speaking here, and and I love the book of Philippians. In the book of Philippians, in verse number 13 of chapter 4, it says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Again, another one of those great blessings of being a follower of Jesus Christ. But right here in chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, notice what Paul says who as he already existed in the form of God. Where did we see that? John chapter 1. God always had a plan. He being Christ. He already existed in the form of God. Did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself. What does that mean? That means he came humbly and gave of himself for you and for me. He took upon himself the form of flesh. Emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man. Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Death on the cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed him a name, the name which is above every name. Verse number 10. So at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven and those who are on earth and those who are under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So here's my question to you this morning, the journey to the cross. We understand that God had a plan for man. God knew that man would sin. And God knew that he did not want to be separated from the very creation of man that he had created. But the, in, in order for, that, uh, for, for us to be reunited with God, there had to be a payment for man's sin. And God had already set in motion to send himself, to send his son Jesus Christ to go to the cross and to pay the debt for you and for me. The question is simple. Have you made a journey to the cross? Have you made your journey to the cross? 
every one of us have been given the invitation. The invitation to the cross. Because as the Apostle Paul says here, I want you to grasp what he's saying in verse number 10. This is a promise. One day, every knee will bow before Jesus. My question is, have you bowed the knee before Jesus yet? There may be a time, if you refuse to do that in your lifetime, that you'll stand before him and you'll have to take a knee then. But that's only to honor who he is. Because you see, it'll be too late for your salvation. The word of God also says that, er, that one day every tongue is going to confess. They're going to cry out and say, you are Christ the Lord. Have you done that yet? That's my invitation to all of us this morning. I don't know how many times you've been in a church service. Maybe it's your first time. Maybe you've been here, I don't know, maybe you've been going to church for years. You've sat in a pew or you've sat in a seat. You've heard the message time and time again. But you personally, you personally, have never made the journey to the cross. I'm not talking about a journey that walks you down to shake my hand and get a hug, although I'd love to do that. I'm not talking about a journey to the offering where you put money in as if you can buy your salvation. I'm not talking about a journey of service, although service is ask of us as followers of him. I'm talking about a free walk. I'm talking about something personal. I'm talking about something that had already been prepared for you. And Jesus right now is knocking at your heart's door. Would you be honest with him this morning? You don't need to be honest with me or that person sitting next to you. You say, well, Pastor, if, if I... Stand up and, and proclaim Jesus Christ today as my Lord. If I say that, you know, I, I, I'm asking Jesus in my heart, man, I've been coming to church. What's that person next to me going to think? Well, can I just ask you this question? When you stand before God, and he says, why would I let you into my heaven? You're not going to look over at Bill or Sarah or John and say, well, hey, listen, what do you think I should tell him? No, 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 no. He's asking you. In fact, he's not going to have to ask you if Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. He already sees the blood that's covered it all. Amen? Amen. Don't be embarrassed. Today is the day of salvation, the Word of God says. Don't leave this house today without knowing Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. Don't leave this house today if you have not taken a journey to the cross. I don't know if you'll ever have that opportunity again, but I will tell you this that if you leave this house today without making Jesus Christ the Lord of your life and think that your time is whatever you want it to be, and you leave this house today and something happens out on the interstate or happens on one of these highways, and you leave this place without Jesus Christ, you're destined for a place that's called hell. Can I just tell you that and be honest with you? God doesn't want you to be there. He loves you so much he sent his son for you. Without any music playing this morning, I just want the stillness and the quietness in this room. I just want you to bow your heads with me. It's the first week of March, the first Sunday. It's the journey to the cross today. In a few weeks, we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when he walked out of the tomb and gives us eternal life. I'm going to ask that no one look around. I want to be serious this morning, please. No one looking around, please. This is between me, just between me 
That's what you're saying. Lord, this is just between me and you. If you've never called on the name of Jesus Christ, you can do it right there. Dear Lord, I know that I am a sinner. And Lord, I know that there is no way you'll let me into your kingdom with my sin. But Father, you loved me so much that you sent your son Jesus Christ to be the substitution sacrifice for me, to go to the cross and to pay my sin debt. Jesus, I want to say thank you for what you did on the cross. And Jesus, I accept your payment for my sin. Jesus, at this very moment, Jesus, I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I know that I cannot save myself, but through your blood, my sin is washed away. That when the Father sees me, he sees that it's been paid in full. Jesus, I want to say thank you. And Jesus, from this moment on, as my Lord and my Savior, I will follow you. Jesus, I ask you to make me new, to change my life daily, that others may see Jesus in me. Jesus, thank you for the eternal life that I now have. In Jesus' name, amen.